and uh, we're gonna get ready to go to the Word and you're so good, come on. Hey, if you haven't grabbed communion, we're gonna take communion here in just a moment and um, not just in a moment, at the end of service. And I'm gonna keep with tradition and, and sit because it helps me out and uh, hopefully it helps you out. Um, hey, we're, we're gonna continue our series uh, this morning. We're on a series of faith and uh, on a series where we're um, looking at characters in the Bible that were recorded because of their faith. Does anybody else feel like this, this is just so appropriate for the season that we're in? I don't know about you, but the last year and a half, it's been so easy to lose faith. You know, it's been so easy to be distracted from faith. It's so easy to um, realize misplaced faith. And uh, I love this series because I just sense that God is moving in our church and uh, lives are being saved, transformed. And uh, the city that we're called to, the city that we're called to requires faith if you know what I mean. And uh, we're here for such a time as this. And so uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna continue this series. Uh, I think the series is called Move, if I'm not mistaken. And what a great title, because sometimes I need to move. Faith moves me to the place that I need to be. And uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, I wanna go to one, one verse, um, media team. There's one, one verse that I wanna look at as we do this series called Keep the Faith. Um, one verse, Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, is, is recording all these men and women um, who lived a life and are recorded because of their faith, their trust in the Lord. And you know, the book of Hebrews was written to people that serve God, followed God, they're experiencing pressure, they're experiencing persecution. You read through the book of Hebrews, you realize that there's people that are falling away from the Lord, they're discouraged. And Hebrews was written to strengthen them. And Hebrews 11 it, it says is, here's, here's these men and women um, who, who we think are like mighty men and women of God, but they're just people just like us. And, and that's what I love about this chapter. They're people just like you and I. And the reason why they're recorded is because of their faith in God. And so Hebrews says in, in Hebrews chapter 12, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And uh, I don't think what it means by that is like, hey, there's a stadium in heaven all consumed with cheering us on. I think when you get to heaven, you're consumed with just being with Jesus. Uh, but I get the analogy, right? But Hebrews chapter 12, there's a great cloud of witnesses. What is that cloud? Hebrews chapter 11, the previous chapter lists all these witnesses that are examples for you and me. And so I'm going to read from the very beginning of Hebrews chapter 11, but we're going to focus on verse 4. It says this, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Here we go, verse 4. And by faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice then came through which he was commanded as righteous. God commended him by accepting his gifts through faith. And though he died, he still speaks. Faith still speaks. I love this definition that Pastor Darrell shared last week. Um, and he shared a definition on now faith, that faith is not just some mental ascension that we push off to the future, but faith is now. Now faith is, I loved it. And he said this, he said, faith is an uninterrupted state of inner confidence rooted in legal standing that God's new and fresh promises are already ours. It's a confident standing of assurance regarding unseen things. It's a continual positioning of oneself under the authority of an agreement. This is what I, I, I love so much about what Pastor Darrell said. It's a continual positioning. Faith requires a continual positioning of the things that God has said. It's his decision to subject all of life to God's will and promises. And so this morning, if you're taking down notes, there's three kind of thoughts that I wanna look at. I wanna look at the necessity of faith. I wanna look at the posture of faith. And then I wanna look at lasting faith. I wanna look at the necessity of faith, the posture of faith, and lastly, lasting faith. If you're taking down notes, could you just write down this title, Keep the Faith? Keep the Faith. Faith. Uh, I'm going to pray and then let's allow the Lord to speak to us this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you that it's living and active. 
God, I pray for anybody here that doesn't know you. God, I pray that they would put their trust in you. God, it's the only place to be. God, I pray for those that have been walking with you. God, I pray that we would be strengthened. God, that our faith in you, God, is, is, is not blind faith. It's not irrational. God, it's faith recognizing your goodness. God, that, God, you have the ability to carry the weight. God, I pray that you would just simply speak to all of us, transform us in your mighty name. And everybody said, amen. amen. You know, when it comes to this idea of faith, you know, I, think, um, I think if you're, if you've run into this, it almost seems like there's a mockery when it comes to faith. Uh, it, it almost seems like when it comes to Christianity's clash with culture, it almost seems like faith gets minimized so much, it's childish. Hey, you're a person of faith. Hey, you know, well, you know, good, good for you, you know? Hey, I'm glad you believe in something, right? Like, 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 like when, I don't know if you've ever encountered this, but as a believer, when you have conversations with people and it's like, hey, I'm a Christian, it's almost like it's like, hey, well, you know, I'm glad you, you know, I'm glad that you found, you know, something. It's almost frowned upon. It, it's like, I recognize, you know, faith. Faith is not childish, but faith is childlike. In fact, when it comes to faith, the necessity, whether we realize it or not, have you noticed that faith is necessary for all areas of life? Have you noticed that faith, like every person, whether you follow Jesus or you don't, everybody exercises faith at some point in your life. Like it was without exception. In fact, faith is the only way in which you move. Faith is the only way you move in any area of life, whether you're saved or not. Do you remember the first time you were supposed to go drive in a car and get your parents to teach you how to drive a car? Do you remember how nerve wracking that was? And you know, I'm talking to the parents right now. Do you remember how nerve wracking? <laughs> That's funny. It, do you remember how nerve wracking you were when you first had to learn how to drive a vehicle and, and, and you're getting in there and the, 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 the petrol pedal, the gas pedal, it's like, this is uncomfortable. I'm only allowed to use one leg, right? You're like, I can't do this two, two foot action. Are you kidding me? And, but, but you at least took a step in that direction because there was evidence for it. You've seen cars on the freeway. You've seen your parents drop you to school in a practice. Like, like do, do you remember, but for some of us that have been driving for so long, we don't even realize that we still exercise faith getting into our vehicle. We still think that this is going to get me to the destination I'm going to be in. But because you've exercised faith so often and so long, your faith has just simply strengthened from the first time to the position that you're in now. You, everybody exercises faith. Like, like there is nothing that's like, it's, it's like empirically, like how, like how do you know your car is going to start in the moment? You don't. But through a series of faith steps, you turn it on, you, you, you reverse out of your drive. What, what are you doing? You're exercising faith. And the longer you do it, your faith has just strengthened. When you start anything new, your first day on the job, you, you exercised faith. And so when it comes to this idea of faith, I think so oftentimes as believers, we think that it's like, oh, you know, it's this irrational, like, like, no, there is evidence for what we believe. There's a reason for why we believe what we believe. Everybody has to exercise faith at some point in their life. In fact, in fact, uh, this isn't in my notes. It, the thing that stops you from moving forward is fear. Fear is the same thing as faith. Fear is just faith in the wrong thing. Fear says, I'm not gonna move forward. Fear says, hey, this is gonna restrict me. Fear says, I'm not, this is not going to work out the way it needs to go. And so fear actually causes you to be stuck. Faith causes you to be, causes you to move forward. When you started that business, it required faith. Everybody has to exercise faith in their life at some point. The question I would be asking myself is where is my faith? Or maybe what, what is my faith in? What is my faith in? You see, faith is necessary for every person here on planet earth. The question is, where is my faith? And so we have postures of faith. We have people that we interact with that have different postures of faith. Number one, the first posture of faith is an unbelieving faith. It's, I don't believe in God. You have faith, you have faith in other things. You have faith in yourself. You have faith in an educational system. You have faith in, in, in the universe, you know, but you just don't believe in God. It's an unbelieving 
faith. You don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You don't believe that He was born of a virgin. You don't believe that He died on a cross to save us from your sins and that He rose from the dead and that He's the only way to the Father. We, you don't have that type of faith. You, you, you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God and He's the only way, truth, and the life. In fact, John 16 verse nine says this, the world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. And, and there's people that we walk in and we walk into that don't believe, they have unbelief. But I guess what I'm trying to point out is that you have to believe in something. You have to believe in something if I don't believe in God, then what do I believe in? If I, don't, if I don't believe in anything and I really do believe that this life is all that there is and when I die, I just go into an eternal state of darkness. If that is what you believe, the problem is, is your life doesn't live accordingly to that. Because if that is what you truly believe, it becomes survival of the fittest. Why would I care for those? I'd be looking out for my best interests. When it comes to morality, there'd be no need for such a thing. Like when it comes, if I was truly to believe that, I just don't live according to it. In fact, when it comes to not believing in God, I just don't have enough faith for that. I just don't have enough faith that there is nothing to this world that we live in. I just, I just don't have enough faith for this. One of the faiths, the, one of the evidences for it, it, it says it in Hebrews chapter 11, it says this, it's he who called things that were not in existence into existence. One of the reasons why I believe there is God, one of the reasons is because I've never seen something ordered come out of chaos. Have you ever seen something ordered come out of chaos without outside intervention? Have you ever seen something order come out of chaos without some sort of outside intervention to fix it? And let me give you a great example. Just go to your backyard. And if you leave that thing unattended, I guarantee you, you're not gonna wake up one morning and have like, wow, that hot tub, that was lovely. I'm so glad that that made its way into my backyard. You, know, you will never wake up one day and be like, oh my goodness, the weeds have pruned themselves. I try to tell my wife that, babe, if we just wait long enough, it'll fix itself. It doesn't. If you wait long enough, you're not gonna have the barbecue pit with the barbecue thick and that you're not gonna have, like if, 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 if you don't attend to something, something ordered is, it, nothing ordered comes out of chaos without outside intervention. And the writer of Hebrews says, he's the one who calls things into existence from things that weren't in existence. This is one of the reasons why I believe in God, that these, th th this is, this is why there is an evidence for our belief system. You know, I read somewhere, you know, an atheist was accusing a Christian, hey, well, you know, you're just scared of the dark. That's why you believe. And this Christian responded, no, you're just afraid of the light. And, and, and when it comes to our world, and let me just give you worst case scenario. Worst case scenario, if I'm wrong, worst case, worst case scenario is, is there is no consequence to my actions. But if you're wrong, if, 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 if you're wrong and there is a God, there is indeed very much consequence to the actions that you choose here on earth. There's postures of faith. There's an unbelieving faith. There's a believing. There's, there's somebody who believes. And, and maybe you're here in church today. You believe in God. You believe in a God. Um, but you don't allow your belief. Somebody who believes doesn't allow their belief to transform their behavior. James 1 verse 19 says this, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Have you noticed that believing in something is still not sufficient? Have you noticed that just because you believe in something doesn't mean that as actually that's sufficient to change or transform you? Did you, did you ever have that realization, the moment where you realize like flying is more overrated than anything else? Like I used to love flying. As a kid, you got to have movies in the back of a seat. You got to drink as much soda as you wanted to because it was free and complimentary. Do you remember when flying was magical? And now as an adult, it, there, there is nothing magical about it. It's a necessary evil. It is simply a glorified bus trip to my next destination. I love traveling. I like getting to my destination, but the plane ride is the unfortunate in between. And when it comes to flying, there is a, there is a person who can understand everything that there is to know about planes. 
There's a person who believes in planes, believe planes get people somewhere. They can believe, they, they know exactly how the radar system works. They know about the aerodynamics. They know about lift. They know about drag. They know about, they know about how the, 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 the maximum velocity you're supposed to get. They, they, they know the altitude you're supposed to stay in. They know everything there is to know about flying a plane, but they never actually get on it. And did that plane, if you never get on a plane, does it have the ability to get you where you need to go? You see, the problem is that there's people, we have a posture of faith called belief. We believe in God. We're comforted by the fact that we believe in God, yet your trust is not in Him. It, you can go to church and know everything there is to know about church and still not put your weight on God. Let me say it like this, you can believe in God, but still never experience the benefits of God. Even the demons believe that there is a God. You know, I believe in God, you know, I believe, I believe that there's a God and I'm just out here doing my best to be the best person I can be. I'm just trying to be a good person. Hey, I don't know if you know this, but God is not trying to make you a good person. In fact, the Bible says that we already stand condemned that my sin nature causes me to be in opposition to God. God is not trying to cause me to be good. God is trying to get me to be perfect. And the only vehicle that will get me to that state is the person of Jesus. He's the one where I put my trust. He's the one where I put my faith. Anything else will not deliver me to the place that I need to go. I can know all there is to know about God. I grew up in church, same. But you can grow up in church and still never get on the plane. You know, I, I, I believe in God. I believe in God and yet you're still the commander of your own ship. You're the one who still directs your life. You're the one who's still in control. You believe in God and yet your belief is not translating into behavior. I believe in God and yet He doesn't have access to my life. He doesn't have access to my world. Your belief doesn't line up. If God really is real, do you think that He might wanna have a say in how you're living your life? If God is, if I really believe in God, would it not benefit me to pause a little bit to say, God, what do you want from me? But we comfort ourselves by the belief in God and we inoculate ourselves from the relationship because at the end of the day, we still wanna be in control. I'm not willing to put my weight and my trust in Him. There's those that believe. Here we go. Number three, there's those that trust. We move beyond belief to a confident state of surrender and a trust. A trusting person has belief in Jesus that's moved beyond a mental state to a life full of confident trust. Hebrews 10 verse 36, it says that the righteous will live by faith. The righteous, those that are righteous live by faith. They live by putting their weight putting their trust in the ability of the person of Jesus. I love what A.J. Swoboda said. He says this, Christian spirituality isn't solely about one's capacity to restate right, true, and accurate beliefs. Christian faith is total trust, submission, and faith in Jesus reflected in the whole person's pursuit to know the one being trusted. Does my faith translate into action. Does my faith in God translate into action in my life? Does my faith cause me to get on the proverbial plane, so to speak, and allow God to get me where I need to go? Does my faith cause me to reconcile relationships when there's been wrong? Does my faith cause me to, to, to deal with an offense because God said, hey, I desire you to live in unity. Does my faith translate into action? Does my faith translate into action when God says, I want you to go, am I willing to go? Or like, Ju like Jonah, do I kind of run away from God? When God says, hey, I want you to reach out and talk to that neighbor, do you exercise faith or do you kind of stay where you are in? And I think there's some people, you're like begging for God to tell you to go. Some of you, you're praying for God to say, God, I, God, you're, tell me to go to another state. And God's saying, no, I want you to stay. I want you to put your roots down. And for some of you, God is saying, I need you to say, it takes more faith for you to stay than for you to leave. And this is what God is saying. Am I willing to allow my faith to dictate my actions? James 1 verse 18, we've heard it before, but some say you have faith and I have works. 
show me your faith apart from your works, but I will show you my faith by my works. My actions indicate my attitude, my behavior reveals my belief system. And, and, and Hebrews chapter 11, what we record, the heroes of the faith, what we see is we see people who didn't just give God mental assent. What we see is we don't just see people who had some good intentions. Hebrews 11, it's recorded for our benefit because they put faith into action. They, they had a trusting faith. Number four, and I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on here, a, a drifting faith. That there is a person who's put their trust in the Lord, but they're drifting. Hebrews chapter two, verse one, it says, therefore we must pay close attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Is there anybody here in this room where you ever felt your faith drifting? Anybody here you found, found, yourself, found yourself drifting? I know I've shared this analogy, but you know, growing up, surfing, one of the first things my dad taught me was when you're out in the waves, you have to find a fixed point on the beach to make sure that you know exactly where you're supposed to be. Because if you don't have a fixed point on the beach, the currents and the toe of the ocean will pull you to places you're not supposed to go. And it's the fixed point, it's the fixed position that allows you to stay safe and secure. And when I'm out surfing, for me to stay in that fixed position, it actually requires effort. For me to stay fixed, it actually requires effort and constant paddling to stay in the position that I'm supposed to. You see, how I've realized I drift in my faith, and I wanna make sure I say this right. Drifting when it comes to my faith is not a conscientious decision to do something wrong. Drifting in my faith is not me making a decision to say, hey, I'm gonna sin right now. I'm gonna do something to sabotage, although that will, that, that will sabotage you. Drifting is not a conscious decision to do something wrong. Drifting happens because of an unconscious decision to not do the right thing. Drifting doesn't happen because of a conscious decision to do something wrong. I drift in my faith when I don't make the, I make unconscious decisions to not do what is right. You see, when it comes to our faith, Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, we must pay close attention so that we don't Drift. Is there anybody here, your faith is running on autopilot? Anybody here, let me ask this question. I have to ask myself, when was the last time, Dylan, you had to exercise faith? When was the last time my life being surrendered to the Lord, it caused me to have to step out of the boat in faith? God, I'm thankful for saving me. When was the last time, Dylan, you had a conversation trying to articulate the gospel to somebody else? Dylan, when was the last time you exercised faith and you walked across a room even though you were nervous? And, and I know you don't think I get nervous, but I get intimidated just like the rest of you and I have to exercise faith. And hey, I noticed you were by yourself. And hey, are you doing okay? It requires faith. When was the last time I exercised faith? When it comes to my finances, my wife and I, we tithe and I'm not trying to talk about finances. I'm trying to talk about faith, but we go into a season of generosity. We are praying now about what we're supposed to give because I'm like, God, I need to exercise faith. I need to do something something to remind myself my trust is in you. I do this every two weeks when I tithe, but God, I wanna do something above and beyond to remind myself that you are the Lord of my life, that you are this, you've done great things for me. I wanna exercise faith. I wanna get stronger at this because if I'm not intentional, what happens if I don't, I unintentionally don't do the right thing. My wife and I, we signed up Avery for soccer and uh, we showed up to practice and uh, there was like, hey, um, we don't have any coaches, would you like to coach? And that's not what I showed up for. I showed up to say, hey, you coach my son. And uh, you do that. This is, this is my time to sit and you know, cheer from the sideline. And basically it was like, well, if we don't have coaches, you don't, your son doesn't play soccer. So I was like, tag, I'm it. But, but you know one of the reasons why I did it? It wasn't just to coach soccer. It was because I wanted to get into my community and meet people. And that takes faith. I'm just, just like you. I wanna meet people. I wanna talk to parents and say, hey, can I be praying for you? Like, this is why, when is the last time I had to exercise faith? Um, faith pleases God. I said it in prayer. Faith pleases God. The outcome, not so much. God doesn't say, hey, I'm pleased to produce something. 
God says, I'm pleased when you exercised faith. I'm pleased when you heard me and you stepped out of the boat and started your business. I'm pleased when you stepped across the room and you had a conversation, even though that person was really cold to you. That's what pleases me. I'm pleased when you said, hey, can I pray for you? Your job's not to heal them. His job is to heal them. Hey, I'm pleased when you said, God, I'm gonna go get a job because this is what you've given me the ability to do. God is pleased when we exercise faith. He's responsible for the outcome. When was the last time you had to exercise faith? Is it just me? Do I convict myself? Am I the only one in the room where I look at my life and I'm like, God, when was the last time I had to exercise faith? Because if I don't intentionally exercise, I find myself drifting. In fact, another word, can I, oh, sorry, here we go. Another word for drifting, it's like it's the buzzword of the day. It's deconstruction. It's, it's, hey, my faith is not working for me. Hey, it's like, hey, church isn't functioning the way it's supposed to, so I'm going to deconstruct. And by the way, deconstructing is nothing new. Like this is a progression. Like in the early 2000s, maybe you were around, do you remember there was the whole emerging church, the whole emergent church? It's, it's hey, we're emerging. We wanna kind of push off the restraints of, of religious order and we're just gonna move into something new. And, and how do I say this? Tradition is not wrong. In fact, tradition helps remind you of what's right. When you have a birthday tradition, you light the candles, you have the cake, why? Because you're celebrating something good that's happened. Tradition is wrong when it becomes more of a priority than the person, right? When the birthday cake becomes more of a priority than the person you're celebrating. And so we had the emerging church and now we have people deconstructing because, hey, I've let go, I've unshackled myself from all the things that are good and now this is not satisfying me. Church is not doing what it's supposed to. Hey, I, I, I look at all this hypocrisy See, when it comes to my house, if you come to my house and brown water is coming out of my pipes, you know what I do? I have to pull some things out. I have to look at what's wrong. I have to go see, hey, why is this not producing what it's supposed to? But you know what I don't do? I don't tear the whole house down. I, I don't pull everything out because the whole thing is wrong. No, I need to. Jesus deconstructed people's religious views. He deconstructed wrong attitudes. He deconstructed some things, but he used the Word of God to go after and say, hey, the, you're doing all these things right, but here's some things you're doing wrong. You don't, set, you don't tell the whole thing down. In fact, you know, how, you know what? God saved me because of my doubts. I had doubts. I said, God, how do I know that you're real? I said, God, how do I know that I'm saved? God, how do I know? But you know what I did with my doubts? I took my doubts and I said, God, I'm gonna put them into your hands and I need you to help me. God is not afraid of your doubts. He's not afraid of your questions. I think sometimes in church, we can say, God, we, if I have a question or there's something wrong with your faith. No, questions is how you strengthen your faith. And I went to God and I said, God, here is my doubts. Jesus had a disciple called Doubting Thomas. He was not afraid of him. But Thomas came to him with his doubts and he said, hey, here, put your fingers in my hands and I'll show you I died. I'll, I'll, I'll show, let, me, let me help you with your doubts. But the problem with doubt is if you don't deal with doubt appropriately, it turns into disbelief. And for so long, if you just keep pushing doubt into a closet and you ignore it, and you're thinking I'm a bad Christian if I have questions, I have a bad Christian if I, I'm looking for these answers. If you don't deal with those things, it turns into disbelief. Doubt says, God, I'm not sure if you can do it. Disbelief says, God, you can't do it. And it's not that God can't do it, but because something wasn't dealt with, you've now written him off. Is there anybody finding themselves drifting? How you deal with drifting is intentionally doing the right thing. Hey, don't neglect the fellowship of the saints. If you're online, I'm glad that you're online. Why? Because when I gather with God's people, I'm reminded again of his goodness. When I go and meet with Avon Swice and he tells me his story, I'm encouraged. I'm reminded, man, God, you are still good. You are still faithful. When we do breakthrough nights and you join a group and you begin to have people accessing your life and they can walk you through the journey that you're on, church is doing what it's supposed to. For Sunday prayer, can I encourage you, church? For Sunday prayer, exchange night. If you've not come, we're gonna meet in EFNG this September. We're gonna pray. We're gonna pray and we're gonna believe that God's gonna move, that He's going to heal, that He's gonna, he's gonna move, he's gonna, he's gonna work. He's gonna work on our behalf. If you need prayer, you need God's intervention, why don't we take a step of intentional action and say, God, I'm just gonna get to your house. And then by the way, I got Lanny Hubbard gonna do a session on end times. 
Because so many people keep coming up to me saying, Dylan, are we in the end times? Is this the end? Are we in the book of Revelation? And so look, I'm just gonna get the professional. Get Lanny Hubbard to come in after prayer. We're gonna just do a whole session on end times next Sunday night, five o'clock. You don't wanna miss it. That was my last plug. Lastly, here we go. Lasting faith. Lasting faith. This is the faith that God is after. After The author of Hebrews encourages people to keep their faith moving forward. Hebrews uses the imagery, running the race with endurance. How do I run the race with endurance? How do we have lasting faith? What a great question to ask. Let's go to the character Abel. You see, when we look at the story of Abel, the only thing we know about Abel, there's only two things we know. And I'll read it from Genesis chapter four. It won't be on the screen, but Genesis chapter four says this. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of his flock and their fat portions. The Lord had regard, that word regard means interest. God had interest in Abel's offering. But but Cain, Cain who just brought some fruits from the ground, he had no regard, he had no interest. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. When we read the story of Abel, the only thing that we know about Abel The only thing that we know that caused Abel to be set apart, to be written in a chapter of faith, the only thing that we see about Abel was he did two things. He brought his first and he brought his finest. Abel brought his first and Abel brought his finest. Abel brought his first. I'm bringing the firstborn, I'm bringing the finest. This is what God said, I have interest in that. Have you noticed that first communicates something? Have you noticed that when you give somebody your first, it communicates something? First reveals your trust. What I put my first attention to, what I put my first finances to, what I put my first, it reveals my trust. It reveals where my trust is. If my first goes to me, it communicates Dylan, I trust your ability more than anybody else. First reveals trust. But first doesn't just reveal trust. First is foundational for the rest. If your first is not right, nothing is right. When you build a house, what's the first thing you do, Roger? It's foundations. What's the first thing you do? You put the foundation. If the foundation is not right, it doesn't matter how good the material it is. It doesn't matter how good the fixtures are. It doesn't matter how good the skillmanship and the workmanship is. If the foundation is not right, it all topples over. Let me say it like this. It doesn't matter what pedigree you come from. It doesn't matter what family you come from. It doesn't matter the resources that are at your disposal. If your foundation, if your first is not right, nothing is right. And this is all we know about Abel. It says about Abel, it says that he gave his first and he gave his finest. And it says that this is what God had regard for. This is what God was interested in. God was interested in this person who said, God, I'm gonna give you my everything. Because first reveals something. First reveals where my affection is. First reveals who, who has who has access to me, first reveals who is in control of my life. Abel said to God, hey, I'm gonna bring you my first. I'm gonna bring you my finest. I'm communicating that you are my foundation. You are the person that, 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 that is first, that means that I'm second. When you do your top, when you button up your shirt, and you start at the top because if I get the first right, everything else falls into place. Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and then love your neighbour as yourself. All of the rest of the law hangs on this. If I get the first right, everything else falls into place. Abel's offering exercised faith. He said the first in an agrarian culture where the first and the strongest, I need them for myself to reproduce. I need them for myself to build a bigger flock. I need them for myself for security. Abel took the first and the finest and he says, God, I'm gonna give them to you because first is communicating I trust you more than I trust me. You see, true faith moves us to wholehearted worship. God was interested in Abel's offering because this is what Abel was saying to the Lord. He says, Lord, you have access to every area of my life. That gets God's attention. Faith says, God, you have access to every area of my life. 
True faith moves us to wholehearted worship. And can I say it like this? Wholehearted worship keeps you moving in faith. Faith causes me to worship God wholeheartedly. Everything that I have, God, you're first. You're first in my time. You're first in my devotion. You're first in my finances. You're first in my world. You're first in my career. You're first in my relationships. God, you are first in every area and that pleases God. That gets God's attention because this is what you're saying to God. God, you have access to everything that I am. Abel's offering was rooted in devotion. Cain's was rooted in duty. Can I say this for a second and just pause here? Abel's offering was rooted in devotion. God, I want you to have all of me. Cain's offering was rooted in duty. This is the sin of second. When God gets my second, it communicates somebody else's first. You know, Kirsty doesn't want my second, she wants my first because first communicates my priority. First communicates what I truly love. Second communicates, second communicates something else has my attention, has my affection. Cain goes to God and says, hey, here's my offering. Here's the sacrifice. Yeah, it's costing me something, but it's not my first, it's my second. And it says this, it says that God was not interested in it. I think this is so powerful. God was not interested in being second in Cain's life because second means that this relationship now is transactional. Hey, hey, I wanna, God, I'll, I'll, I'll do what I have to because because I, just in case, I'll do what I have to because you know it'd be nice to have you on my team, but I'm still gonna hold everything for myself. Second, the sin of second is that, that something else is first and if God, you're not first then something else must be and that somebody else is usually me. And says God was not interested in second because second communicates transaction. First allows for transformation. Second Second is a transactional relationship. First is transformational. The sin of second communicates who is really in control. And I've never seen this before. And we're gonna go take communion in a second. I've never seen this before. Because in, in God's interaction with Cain, God comes to Cain because He knows Cain is about to murder Abel. He's about to kill Abel and Abel is going to die in faith. God, I gave you my first. And this is why he's first in this chapter. And God knows what Cain is about to do. And I've, I've never seen this before, but in Genesis chapter four, it says this, God comes to Cain and he says, if you, you'll do well, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted? But if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. I, I always read that thinking that God was coming to Cain saying, hey, sin is coming, be careful, you gotta master this, you got a problem. But as I began to read this, I, I began to see something different. Because God was second in Cain's life, it meant that somebody else was first. Cain was responsible for his future. Cain was the one who had to fix his situation. Cain, by not putting God first, was saying, God, I'm first. And God comes to Cain and he says, you're in a predicament. Sin, is, sin desires you. And because I'm not first, you need somebody else to save you. And the only person that can save you right now, the position you've put yourself in is you. Sin is crouching at the door. You must master it. You have to save yourself. You have to save yourself from sin because you're not surrendered to the person who can conquer sin for you. You see, when it comes to lasting faith, it says that Abel put God first. And by putting God first, it says that, God, you have my everything. First leads to wholehearted worship and wholehearted worship leads to exercising faith. I worship God when I come to church and I'm not here to consume, I'm here to pour out. Lasting worship says, God, you have my everything. And so, hey, this person's in need. Here you go, God, you can have it. Lasting, lasting faith happens when I put God first. And it says this about Abel and he still speaks. Abel still speaks to you and I 
that when it comes to faith, the reason why he's recorded is he put God first. I guess the question I'm asking myself this morning is, Dylan, where's my faith? The question I'm asking is, is God evaluate where I'm at? God, do I have lasting faith or am I drifting in my faith? Have I put my trust in you or am I just still just kind of believing in you but not putting my weight on you? Do I not believe at all? Where's, where's my faith? And uh, as a church, we're gonna take communion here. And the reason why we commune is we sit at a table. It's supposed to be at a table to remind myself of the relationship that I have with the Lord, remind myself of what God has done. And bands are gonna come to the platform. We're gonna sing in just a moment and pray. But before we take communion, I gotta ask a really important question is, do you have faith in Jesus or don't you? Where is your faith? Because the Bible says this, it says, don't take communion if you don't have faith in Jesus. This is what the Bible says. It says, don't take communion if you, don't, if you haven't put your trust in Jesus because it will make you sick. How does it make you sick? You see, when, when I sit at a table with somebody and I have relationship with them, we had some people over on Wednesday night and uh, I saw them again this morning. We ate dinner, we had a good time and, and I got to talk with them about, hey, that was so great just eating and communing and that was so fun talking about that, that Joe, like, like I'm reminding myself of the relationship that I have with that person. This is what communion is. I'm reminding myself of what God has done for me. But how can you remind yourself of what God has done for you if you've never experienced it? How can you commune with somebody that you've never surrendered to? And how does it make you sick? It makes our faith sick because we don't even realize it. I'm going through religious ritual, but not encountering true relationship. And what happens is I believe a lie that I'm all good with God, yet I've never encountered Him. And with every eye bowed and every eye closed, if you're here this morning, where's the faith? Have you kept the faith? Where's my faith that if you're here and you'd say, Dylan, to be honest with you, I've known about God, but I've never put my trust in Him. I don't believe in a God. And maybe you were that person at the beginning of worship. And hey, I've tried everything. I've put my trust in everything and I'm at my wits end. And you're telling me that Jesus can save me. If I get on this plane, He's not gonna make me good. He's gonna make me perfect. He's gonna transform me from the inside out. If you're here this morning or you're online and you've put your trust in so many other things, relationships, and it's only produced fracture. You've put your hope in friends and it's only left you disappointed. If you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus or if you're here and you'd say, Dylan, I've been drifting. I, I knew Him at one point, but I've not been serving Him. I, he's not first. I've made myself first. If you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus, would you just raise your hand? I wanna pray a simple prayer where we can make it right, where He can come in and wash you and cleanse you, forgive you of all your sin and transform you. If that's you, you say, Dylan, that's me. I need to give my life to Jesus. Would you just raise your hand right where you're at? If you're online, you can just go ahead and type. I just wanna see your hand. You just lift it up so I can see and then you slip it back down. Come on, awesome. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on, anybody else, that's awesome. If you're here and you'd say, Dylan, I'm following Jesus, but I find myself drifting. I find myself going on autopilot. Would you pray for me? If that's you, would you raise your hand? Come on, hands going up all over, awesome. Hands keep going up, awesome, awesome. This is why we take communion to come back to the place where it all began to say, God, remind me again where my trust is. Would you stand to your feet? And um, we're gonna take communion and then we're gonna go back into this song and just worship for a little bit. It's the, all the saints and angels, right? It's one of my favorites. Because he's worthy of it all. 
We're gonna take communion. If you raise your hand to give your life to Jesus, you just pray a simple prayer. If you're online, you just say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Wash me, make me clean. I'm giving you my life. I'm giving you my all. Forgive me. I'm putting my trust in you. Just a simple prayer, a sign of surrender. And he comes in and he encounters you. Nothing's the same. For those of you that raised your hand, we're gonna take communion because we're gonna remind ourselves, God, you're right. My trust is not in my ability. God, my trust is in your ability. You saved me. You washed me and you forgave me. I'm gonna remind myself of what you've done. And so let's take the bread right now. You can eat it. Father, we thank you for your body, which was broken. Jesus, I thank you that you died on a cross and you were beaten for me so that I wouldn't have to beat myself up anymore. God, I got so good at beating myself up because every time I made a mistake, I thought it was my responsibility to be better. But God, you were broken so that I could be healed and whole. So Jesus, we come today and I remind myself, thank you for your sacrifice. Jesus, thank you that I can have relationship with you, not because of my ability, but your ability. God, remind me again of where it all began. Remind me again of my first love. Remind me again of when you saved me when I was in my dorm room. God, remind me again of you invading my world. God, remind me again, you're where my trust is. Jesus, I thank you for being broken for me. Jesus, I thank you that you are the one that sustains me. Everything else fades. Come on, let's drink the juice together. Jesus, we thank you for your blood. Jesus, thank you for washing me, cleansing me. Jesus, we come to you again. We come at the table, reminding myself that even though my righteousness was like filthy rags, my sin, the dirt, the guilt, the shame, God, I thank you that your blood, you wash me whiter than snow. Jesus, I thank you for the confidence that I have, not because of my ability, but because of your ability. Jesus, I'm coming to you again to surrender. God, I surrendered it years ago, but I'm surrendering it again this morning. Jesus, today, you're my Lord. You're who I put my faith in. You're my first. You're my first, you have my all. Jesus, I thank you that you wash me whiter than snow. God, I pray that today, tomorrow, this week, God, my faith would be in you, in your mighty name.